Welcome to Vintage Auto Docs. Get ready to take a trip back in time as we explore a treasure trove of dealer brochures, newspaper ads, and other automotive memorabilia from yesteryear. Join us as we delve into the fascinating backstories behind these vintage documents, giving you a glimpse into what it was like to be a car enthusiast in the past. Your host is Bob Doring, the curator of the Vintage Auto Docs collection, and he can't wait to share these incredible pieces of automotive history with you. Get ready to rev your engines and step into a world of automotive nostalgia. Bob Doring, curator of Vintage Auto Docs here. In this episode, we uncover a remarkable magazine ad showcasing the 1969 Volkswagen Beetle. We'll examine its features before diving into some fascinating stories behind the Beetle. Let's check it out. The Volkswagen Beetle is an iconic car that has been around for decades. However, before 1949, Americans had never seen one on their roads. The automobile industry was forever changed after a German origin brand took center stage in post-Hitler era, thanks to the efforts of William Bernbach, Ned Doyle, and Maxwell Dane, who founded their own ad agency back in 1949. Their secret weapon? Pitching clients with limited budgets by delivering smart, catchy campaigns that didn't overwhelm consumers like other agencies did at the time. Helmut Krohn was hired as an art director at DDB in 1954. He had already been a Volkswagen customer for years before the agency pitched to work with them on their advertising campaigns. The love affair between Helmut, William Bernbach, and Julian Koenig towards this car led them to actively pursue VW as one of their clients. In 1955, when VW opened its sales arm called Volkswagen of America, located in Inglewood Cliffs, New Jersey, it faced stiff competition from American automotive giants like Ford, GM, and Chrysler, who sold millions of cars annually during that time period alone. Despite these challenges, though, DDB managed to create some truly iconic ads which helped propel VW into becoming one of America's most beloved brands today, thanks largely due to their innovative approach and creativity behind those memorable taglines, such as Think Small. The post-World War II period saw widespread hostility towards Germany and its product. In 1925, Bela Baranyai, the father of passive safety in automotive design, was credited with being the originator of the Beetle design after successfully suing Volkswagen for copyright violation. Ferdinand Porsche was born in Austria during the year 1875 and had two dreams, the first being his passion for building high-performance racing cars, while simultaneously aiming towards creating an affordable vehicle that could be accessible to all Germans alike. After working tirelessly at Daimler-Benz, he eventually received widespread admiration when one of his designs won the Targa Florio race event back in 1924. As the 1920s progressed, Porsche became increasingly convinced that a small vehicle designed specifically for everyday people would play an integral role in advancing industrialization and growth within his country. Unfortunately though, despite this visionary thinking, his employers did not share his views on such matters. Instead, they focused primarily on creating luxury cars during this time period before any public warning of war in the 1930s. Hitler's vision for an affordable car was a driving force behind his desire to turn it into reality. He sent out staff members who investigated various auto manufacturers until they reached Porsche, who traveled to meet Hitler in person. The Führer immediately was impressed with Porsche. He became one of only a handful of people that could speak directly to him without consequence. Porsche was given a set of guidelines by Hitler himself for his proposed people's car. It had to seat five individuals, two adults and three children, at an affordable price point, no higher than that of motorbikes available in the marketplace during those times. Additionally, it needed to be easily repairable with minimal maintenance requirements. The car must also be air-cooled since most Germans did not have access to garages or heated spaces where radiators could function properly throughout winter months without freezing up completely. This made this aspect critical when designing such vehicles back then. It is likely that Porsche already had all this in mind, as Hitler was well known for repeating others' ideas as his own. But with the funding and backing of the Nazis, Porsche finally could begin working on his people's car. The Allies faced a daunting task after World War II ended. How could they prevent Germany from becoming another global powerhouse, while also avoiding repeating past mistakes of World War I? 
One solution was to revive some of its industrial strength to help the Germans restore some national pride. Major Ivan Hurst was a firm believer in the Volkswagen and was put in charge of the Wolfsburg factory. He found an old prototype hidden away, and he then instructed workers to slowly reassemble machinery for building this vehicle. The Volkswagen was steadily gaining popularity throughout Europe during the 1950s as restrictions on exportation from Germany were lifted. The car had become a favorite among consumers due to its affordability and practical nature compared with flashier models offered by Chevrolet or Oldsmobile. By word of mouth advertising alone, sales figures for this vehicle reached 100,000 units in 1958. This prompted major manufacturers like Ford or General Motors to take notice of the emerging market demand for smaller cars that could offer more value than their luxury counterparts did at the time. Volkswagen faced a daunting challenge when they sent Carl Hahn to America. How could they promote their small, slow, and unattractive foreign car in an already crowded market? The task was monumental, but not impossible for the right advertising agency. DDB proved themselves up to this challenge by transforming Volkswagen's Beetle into one of America's most beloved icons. Having visited many Madison Avenue offices, seeking inspiration from various companies' pitches, Han found himself underwhelmed with what he saw. Most presentations featured generic illustrations depicting happy families admiringly posed around the vehicle on pristine driveways. These cookie-cutter approaches failed to capture his attention or imagination. Through a contact, Han found himself at the offices of DDB, where he received an unexpected pitch from Bill Bernbach. Unlike other agencies that presented mock-ups or drawings beforehand, Bernbach didn't have any concept for his ads yet, instead opting to showcase past works by DDB itself. This honesty and transparency impressed Han greatly, as it demonstrated how much faith Bernbach had in his team's abilities. The contract was signed soon after, with Volkswagen agreeing on payments worth $600,000, meager compared to what larger manufacturers like Chevrolet at $30.4 million or Ford at $25 million in annual spending on advertising campaigns alone. Nonetheless, this investment proved fruitful, as research conducted by Starch Company revealed that Volkswagen's ads scored higher than editorial pieces published within various publications. Upon visiting the Volkswagen factory in Germany with his team from DDB, Bernbach was struck by how much pride workers took in their craft. He remarked to Helmut Krohn that this car represented an honest product. Krohn, who owned a VW himself, had already been leading a campaign for the car for local dealership with DDB, so he seemed a natural pick to lead the corporate campaign. His Jewish copywriter partner didn't let any Nazi connections bother him either. He focused solely on creating compelling messaging instead. The client's advertising manager, Helmut Schmitz, was reading through Koenig's copy when he noticed a small line that caught his attention. He pointed at Think Small and declared it should be the headline instead of maybe we got so big because we thought small. This pleased Koenig since originally his idea had been to use Think Small as the title, but Krohn convinced him otherwise by suggesting we'll come in. The campaign came to be known as Think Small, despite some initial resistance from the art director, who required intervention from Bernbach to persuade him to come up with some layouts before agreeing on an unconventional layout with traditional elements. Krohn's approach to advertising was anything but conventional. He experimented extensively before settling on a traditional ad layout with an unconventional twist, the old Givy layout, as he called it jokingly. The genius of this design lay in its ability to take something familiar and alter it just enough so that it appeared fresh and new, this included setting the heading and body text in sans-serif typeface Futura, a departure from most copy up until then, which had been set in serif fonts. The period placed at the end of the headline forced readers to pause and reflect upon what they had read, another trademark element for Krohn. In contrast to traditional car advertisements that emphasize luxury and grandeur, Volkswagen took a different approach with their ads in the 1960s. Rather than touting speed or power, they focused on humor and irreverence by acknowledging the limitations of their vehicles, specifically how slow they were compared to other cars at the time. This was done through clever copywriting that appeared to insult their own product, but ultimately drew readers in for more information about why owning a small car could be an advantage over larger ones despite its lackluster performance. The tone shifted from playful mockery towards something more serious as the ad continued. 
When it comes to owning a car that can break almost any speed limit in the country while also being able to cruise past gas stations and repair shops without issue, there's no better choice than investing in AVW. The engine may not be known for its lightning fast speeds, but what sets this vehicle apart is how advanced it truly is. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. By highlighting these unique features of the VW model, they showcased why choosing one over other options could benefit drivers looking for both performance and efficiency on their daily commutes or road trips alike. With such an impressive track record when it comes to reliability and durability, who wouldn't want to get behind the wheel? Krohn was not a fan of using logos in his advertisements. He believed they detracted from the message being conveyed However, when it came to promoting Volkswagen's vehicles through print ads, he made an exception by placing their logo awkwardly between columns two and three, instead of where readers would expect it, atop or below headlines or slogans. This unconventional placement immediately grabs attention, while also conveying that this is no ordinary car commercial. Additionally, Krohn's decision to use a simple photograph rather than elaborate illustrations sets apart VW's campaign from competitors who relied heavily on flashy graphics for impact. The photo itself is positioned diagonally within ample white space, allowing viewers to focus solely on its sleek design without distraction from other elements on page layout. Volkswagen's Think Small campaign was a game changer in the world of advertising, it challenged traditional norms by presenting an empty background that forced viewers to focus solely on their product, the Volkswagen Beetle. This unique approach allowed customers to see beyond its foreign origins and appreciate it as a distinctive design statement with personality. The ad copy may have appealed to family men, but what truly made this campaign stand out were the high fashion visuals targeting teenagers looking to make bold statements about themselves through their choice of vehicle ultimately leading VW on to becoming one of the most popular brands among young people at the time. VW created something special, a sense of community among those who felt disconnected from mainstream society due to differing values or lifestyles choices. It resonated with hippies and surfers alike who embraced the Beatle as part of their culture because it represented freedom from conformity. Today, we still see remnants of this movement through various subcultures, but none have had quite the impact nor lasting power as did Volkswagen's Think Small campaign. These strategic choices all contribute towards making Volkswagen's advertising stand out, among others, in automotive industry during 1960s era. The black and white color scheme used throughout the entire ad created an eye-catching effect when viewed alongside other vibrant pages within Life magazine, where it first appeared for consumers, everything about the ad screamed honesty and simplicity, which resonated deeply with audiences across America during that era. Despite Krohn initially hating his creation, he later received praise from Koenig, who stated that only after some time did the Think Small ad become famous. What truly made this piece stand out was its ability to connect with consumers on an emotional level by tapping into their frustrations about being pressured into buying things for happiness instead of finding it within themselves first, which remains one of advertising's most significant achievements ever. In the 1969 VW Beetle ad we are reviewing in this episode, the ad design steps away from the typical large white space design, but it doesn't disappoint. Instead, the design uses an American Gothic-style photo of Father Aloysius Bittman and one of his VW Beetles standing in front of his vintage church out on the plains. The ad copy states, After 30 Volkswagens, Father Bittman still believes. In the beginning, Father Aloysius Bittman bought a bug. That was in 1957 when he joined the staff of St. Anthony's Indian Mission in Mandurey, North Dakota. Since then, Father Bittman has gone a long way. In 30 Volkswagens. Owning two or three at a time, the Bittman staff travels 600 miles per week in each. Over dirt and gravel roads, and in temperatures that have been known to go to 55 below. A couple of Volkswagens ago, Father Bittman's 65 broke through the garrison reservoir ice. It was a good time for praying, he said. Luckily, one 255-pound priest and one 1,808-pound bug floated to safety. After the ice was chopped away in a quick oil change, the good father and his faithful companion were on their way. 
He was a bit peeved about the oil change, though. It set the mission back $1.80, complained Father Aloysius Bittman. Although not a lot is known about Father Aloysius Bittman, we do know he was a Catholic priest who served at St. Anthony's Indian Mission in Mandurey, North Dakota, from 1957 to 1973. He was known for his devotion to the Native American community and his love for Volkswagen cars. He drove them across the rough terrain of the reservation. He died on January 2, 1973, and was buried at Assumption Abbey Cemetery in Richardson, North Dakota. He is remembered as a true North Dakotan and a loyal Volkswagen fan. What brand brand ambassador would not hold more credibility than Father Bittman? They even were able to substantiate further claims of the ability of the VW Beetle to float with one of his anecdotes. In 1969, four models were available from Volkswagen. The Beetle, the iconic compact car with a rear-mounted engine and a distinctive shape, the Carmen Ghia, a stylish two-door coupe or convertible based on the Beetle chassis, the Transporter, a versatile van or pickup truck with various configurations and uses, and the Type 3, a larger and more modern car than the Beetle, offered as a fastback, squareback, or notchback. In 1969, the Beetle was still at its peak sales and outsold any other model by far, with sales of 377,322 cars. The Type 3 model came in second with only 26,000 cars, followed by 12,000 500 transporters and 9,595 Carmen Gias. You might think the 1969 VW Beetle was the same as the previous models, but there were some subtle improvements that year. Double joint rear axles, so-called independent rear suspension on all US models, warning lights and speedometer get letters for identification, day-night rear view mirror, steering lock included in ignition lock, floor hot air vents move slightly rearward, warm air outlets at base of doors move further rear with remote knobs on door columns, and finally the speedometer gets one-tenth mile indicator. The specifications of the 1969 VW Beetle were similar to previous years. It had a 53 brake horsepower, 91 cubic inch displacement engine with a one barrel carburetor. That was about one quarter of the horsepower found in a 1969 Chevy Impala, but it only had to move half of the weight as the Beetle weighed in at a paltry 1,742 pounds. It was rear wheel drive with a four speed manual transmission. Its top speed was 82 miles per hour, but it provided 25 miles per gallon fuel economy. In comparison, a 1969 Chevy Impala had a top speed of 130 miles per hour at 11.5 miles per gallon. So clearly a choice had to be made. Do you want speed or fuel economy? There was a unique VW Beetle model offered in 1969, the Volkswagen Beetle 1500 Wedding Sedan. This wrought iron-bodied wedding beetle was hand-built. The car was used for private weddings in certain regions of Mexico. Six copies were produced, each with a unique pattern of wrought iron. This vehicle was originally given to one of the first VW distributors in the United States. This car was made of wrought iron by the hands of a Mexican craftsman, Rafael Esparza Prieto. A parts company for the German brand in Mexico commissioned Esparza with some pieces as a promotion for the store. The workshop was very close to the automotive plant, which is why it caught the attention of some executives from the VW Mexico company. Esparza was commissioned with this 1969 Volkswagen Beetle wedding model in special commemoration for the 1968 Olympic Games that would be held in Mexico City. The model was forged on a template of the body of the iconic model Beetle, and the craftsmen subsequently built around 20 units, now all collectible. This piece of art, made of wrought iron painted white, which could be Cinderella's carriage, except it doesn't turn into a pumpkin. The 1969 VW Beetle is more than just a car. It represents simplicity, reliability, and timeless appeal. This iconic vehicle has been cherished by generations of drivers who appreciate its unique character. The acceleration may be gradual, but once you reach cruising speed, the smile on your face will say it all. Owning this classic ride means becoming part of an international community where fellow bug enthusiasts share stories about breakdowns, adventures, and roadside fixes over cups of coffee or long drives across scenic route. Whether commuting daily or embarking on weekend getaways with friends or family members, 
Driving around in style behind the wheel of such an unforgettable automobile always invites conversations from strangers passing by. So hop in, adjust the mirrors, and let the Beetle take you on a journey through time. It's not just a car, it's a piece of history, a symbol of freedom, and a reminder that sometimes the joy is in the journey itself. If you recall seeing these classic style VW ads back in the day, or have stories of a VW you owned or enjoyed, share them in the comments below. We would love for you to add to the history of one of America's favorite cars. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Vintage Auto Docs. Be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notification of future episodes. This show is inspired by the lifelong collection of vintage auto docs of the late Bill McConkie, a World War II veteran from Cambridge, Ohio. We are grateful beyond measure for his efforts at preserving history through these documents. Join us again soon, as we continue exploring this fascinating topic together. As you journey forward, don't forget, from time to time, to glance back at the rearview mirror. Enjoy the experiences of yesteryear, and have an amazing trip ahead.